Okay, welcome back. Definitely no technical errors at all there. We are live now, though. Uh, no, 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 none at all. Um, yeah, so not sure what happened there, but fortunately we were only a minute or so into this. So, yeah, welcome back, everybody, to the Dallas Prospect. I am DDP, joined with a special guest here today. We got TMP, also known as Mavs Highlight. If you're in a Mavs Twitter, follow there. All of the best highlights of the game, several of which we'll actually have here in this stream. So that's cool, too. But uh, we'll be talking game six as well as previewing this Thunder series we got next round here. TMP, how are you doing? Doing good, DDP. How are you, my man? I'm doing well. Doing well. A little hectic, but uh, getting by, getting by. Life, right? Life. Yep. Over the last 20 games or so to close out the season, just forget about those two final games where they're resting everybody, right? Over yeah. the, la of the last quarter of the season, basically, this team buried its old identity of the live or die by the three persona. It's kind of like said, hey, no, 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 we've got a new identity now. Now we are junkyard dogs. Now we are fighters. Now we want to roll up our sleeves and battle with you in the mud for 48 yep. minutes. And if you're not up for it, then we're walking away with a dub, right? Because we're gonna we're gonna fight to a man. Everyone's gonna fight, and so one of the ways I've been kind of in my own mind processing this new identity of our beloved Mavericks is that they're two Lamborghinis and junkyard dogs. Because we've got, of course, Luca and Kyrie, who are the two of the best very yeah. best shot makers and clutch game players in the whole world, and then pretty much everybody else has this similar personality of like, oh, you want to fight? Let's go. And yeah. I, I just, I love it, man. Cause I mean, obviously, obviously Luca and Kyrie are up for, are up for the fight too, but yeah. like, they have all the skill in the world, but everyone else, they have their skills and they fit right where they fit. Of course they got to get them where they fit in, but they all have this like snarling kind of defensive identity. And I just love it. I love it, man. I, I'm so excited that they're carrying that identity into the playoffs and through that first round win. Yep. No, absolutely. I mean, yeah, you, you said it, the, the, the shift in identity for this team actually going from, you know, a team that just lived and died by the three and they could win the games in the hundred twenties or something like that. Sure. But if, if you had a game where the three point shot wasn't falling, for instance, it, you were, you were basically sunk, you were dead in the water yep. and mid season to, to pull that off um, that complete shift to go from a, a average at best defense on your, your best night to like, a legitimate top tier defense is Absolutely. that's that's such a staggering sudden transformation because yeah. uh, I mean even at the deadline like nobody was nobody was really hyping up these moves like even if they're like oh PJ Washington's a nice enough player you still had like Bleacher Report and outlets like that saying that oh the Mavs probably going to miss the playoffs so they certainly weren't expecting anything like this and when you pair that with how the Clippers were through the first half of the season you know. Um, they actually had a stretch there where right before I think the all-star break, they had actually pushed up towards like that one seed uh, in the that. West. Yeah. And then it, and it kind of kind of came undone for them in the second half of the season. And before that, that preview I did for that series, that was something I talked about was like, yeah, the Mavericks, if you look like their last 30 games, it was like 21 and nine. The Clippers were like 17 and 15. Like these were two teams heading in very different directions. And Kawhi if he's not healthy. War of attrition. Several of the predictions I had were very much on the money. I, I was happy to see, but uh, the the one thing I got wrong was I thought Dante was going to be a much bigger factor than he was. Um, but I, I still have some hope there, though. I do. I still have yeah. hope that he can contribute to this postseason. Absolutely. Because we're in for kind of an interesting next round. Um, without getting too far ahead of ourselves here, but yeah. this next matchup is going to be particularly interesting. It's going to test this team in, I think, different ways than we saw against the Clippers. No doubt. Uh, let's see here. So one of the things that we're going to incorporate here is some of these clips actually from game six here, which you provided. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the help with that. Oh, sure, man, of course. Uh, let's see here. So bring this in here. Sweep it. Yeah, I know it goes. It wants to make you and me like the primary. I'm like, no, no, no. We're not the focus here for a minute. Uh, this play is just, just the, the hustle and everything that we saw. It's another one of those things that like, I just don't think we saw much of from this team in the first half of the season was just that kind of like relentlessness staying after it, the offensive boards like this. Cause that was one of our Achilles heels in recent years was just offensive rebounding, like rebounding in general. Um, and so, yeah, they're, they're having multiple guys crashing the paint, going up over guys, 
getting the board, staying after it. Just love it. PJ and uh, Gafford there really doing something special, I think. Absolutely. And those three in particular, on, on the floor right now, you've got Luke and Kyrie, the, the, the studs, right? Yeah. And then you've got, and at the end of the play, you see PJ Gafford and Derek Jones Jr. all kind of just right around the rim, right? Mm-hmm. Like knowing their roles, like how often in the past would we've been used to seeing that be that, that shot that Luca misses being just a one and done down the trip, down the floor, yeah. right? Where it's like, oh, Luca missed, got to hustle back, got to try to get back. Now, these guys go after it. Like the play is never dead, right? They yeah. fall in the air you got like like the old uh finding nemo seagulls you got multiple mavericks all going mine mine, mine. <laughs> like they're they're all like that that ball's mine that belong that, that ball belongs to me and they go for it and they fight for it and they scrap for it man like it's yeah. not it's not the, the play's not over until a whistle blows or until someone secures the ball safely like if the ball is loose we've got multiple guys and i would i would add to these three uh dante exum and josh green those guys with just the mindset of like oh i could go get that ball right not yeah. i better hustle back like you can just see and, and i know we love to dog him and i haven't been the biggest fan as a player he's one of my favorite players of all time but this team is starting to take on the defensive identity that jason kidd played with and yeah. I, I don't know if they know that or not, but like I, I see it as someone who watched most of his games that were televised throughout his career, uh, especially when he was with the Mavs, of course. Uh, like he just had that never say die mindset. Like he was always the guy who would get that ball that no one thought could could be gotten by that team. He was always the guy picking up the steal. He was always the guy contesting. He was always the guy not giving up on a play. And now mm-hmm. we've got a roster that I think he just loves because it reflects the way he thinks the game should be played. And, and yeah. I think they're doing a great job. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, it's uh, it's good that he's got a roster constructed the way he wants it at this point, since he's now got a new deal for himself. Uh, yeah. I didn't I didn't see the details of that. How many do we know how many years with the money yet? I just saw that he got to extend it. I did not. I did not. I okay. saw some I saw some online commentary about it, but I didn't see if the numbers were disclosed. Yeah, I hadn't seen the numbers yet. So if we see that during the thing or if somebody in the comments already knows it, feel free to throw yeah. that there. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, I'm curious. I'm not surprised. I mean, it, it is what it is regardless. I know kid is almost like a game by game experience, how people <laughs> like them or hate them. Um, I have certainly been critical at times, but yeah, I, I, to me, even before actually winning the series, I felt like it was inevitable because it's like two of his three years, you're getting 50 wins. You had the deep playoff run, the way you put it together after the trade deadline this year, I was just like, there's, there's no way they don't extend him, Even if he's not the best coach you could have he's done enough to at least deserve uh, another go at it. So, and and the Laker thing the other day where they were like linking him to LA, I was like, that's such just a manufactured, like, ah, you better hurry up and secure us sort of thing. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. Who put that out there? Like kids can't like. Definitely uh, kids agent. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Like no, nobody's rushing to to LA right now. um, Mm -hmm. I feel like so. Sure. Yeah. But this is a, the, the identity shift of this team is just staggering and looking, looking at that. One of the, one of the things that was a little bit surprising for me kind of in this Clipper series was Gafford's struggles. Like I really thought, Gaff- I mean, he, he came around as the series progressed, but those first two, two and a half games, especially, it was just like, man, you can barely be on the floor right now. Like this is not good. No. Uh, pairing that with not getting enough out of those, kind of role players and it was just really oh this one's bad audio um and it was just sort of a yeah a difficult balance here but you know as you see here in like game six like yeah he's actually able to hold his ground with zubats he got better with the physicality which i I think definitely uh helps this team out a lot and then just them staying after it diving for loose balls right um staying glued to their man like Good Lord, Paul George loves a good push-off, doesn't he? <laughs> I, I don't think he can play basketball without a couple push-offs uh, every few seconds, yeah. The thing yeah. things I love about this play, like you said, and Gafford deserves to be the, the main focal point here of this play, but watch how Derek Jones Jr., like a shark, dives yeah. in. As soon as the ball is loose, he's there. Like, watch it. Like, he's so quick-footed. Boom, yeah. he's like right there, man. He's always ready to make a help side play. And and be a helper. And that like guys like that, I imagine to have a guy like that as a teammate is just a dream come true. But yeah, as far as like Gafford, yeah, he, it looked like, and you hate to say this about a guy you love, but those first couple games, it looked like the lights might be too bright. You know, you were Mm -hmm. like, Oh no, is he rattled? Does he not have confidence? And then I I didn't hear anyone. You may have read someone that did, but I didn't hear anyone predicting, but in, in hindsight, 
it makes sense that Zoo would be a really hard matchup for him, right? Because yeah. Gafford is the bully, you know? Gafford yeah. is the guy who's like, hey, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to push you around. And Zoo's just like, dude, I am 30 pounds heavier than you and five inches taller than you or whatever it is. And I, I'll bully you, the bully, you know? And so I didn't predict it, but in hindsight, I was like, oh, I can kind of see that, right? Because they both kind of want to play the same type of strong guy game. It's just that one of them is much stronger than the other. And so, and that that's, that's one of the things we're like, I think the next series is going to be a much more natural series for Gafford, right? Yeah, no, I, I think so. This is a, uh, it's going to be interesting to see. Cause I, yeah, the, the bright lights thing, I had, I had that fear a little bit with lively coming in and I feel like game. Yeah, sure. Maybe that kind of moment. A little bit, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. What, what he brought into the, into the table uh, for this team was just incredible for them. Like his rim protection, the, the fact that the Clippers, uh, field goals around the basket was so much like his the way he altered shots doesn't even have to be blocked just the way that he bothered shots right. I, I still feel like this series could have ended a game earlier had he been uh in there to close at the end of game five oh, right, um yeah. but even still like i understand what the the rationale was but i feel like yeah if, if you're getting blow by six times by harden as he's hitting floaters in the fourth quarter particularly three in a row down the stretch you got to figure out something back there to, if not get a piece of it, at the very least, get up high enough and like make him have to like think about it a little bit instead of just uncontested floaters, just drive after drive. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. And and on Derek Lively, you know that that first game in the playoffs, so everything is his first, right? It's all first yep. for him. But it was in addition to the first game back since his mother's passing. You know, you're yep. just like, golly, man. And so like, I, I didn't see very much of it. I think Mass fans were very understanding of like, hey, let's let's go easy on the kid. You know, let's go easy on him because <laughs> that first game he was not great, but it was just incredibly understandable with all of the the emotional weight he's carrying uh, in his life right now. But like you said, as the series went on, he just started looking and playing like himself, like the D-Live that we're used to cheering on, right? The guy who's yep. got that almost like instinctual defensive mindset, the guy who is obviously a great rim runner and all that, but just is going to be an, I think, elite defensive backline presence here maybe in the next couple of seasons. He's already really good, but I think oh, yeah. the sky is the limit for him. The way I've kind of described him, and I'm not saying I'm exactly right. I'm sure there's you know better ways to describe it, but you know way you heard like uh, you heard stories of like baby Mozart, like kid Mozart, you know, like they mm -hmm. put a harpsichord in front of him and he just get, he just gets it, you know, he just immediately understands it, and that's kind of how I see D Live when it comes to defense. Like I think he just gets it. Like I think you tell it tell it to him a couple times and he's like, got it, coach, and, yep. he, and it really is like he's got it, you know. Like you watch him make adjustments and he doesn't make he doesn't tend to make the same type of mistake over and over. You may yep. get him once. You're not going to get him multiple times. Like there was one time in this series with the Clippers where he, and it was a, it was bad defense on, on his part where he gave a uh, zoo, the baseline and zoo yeah. took it and scored. And I don't think zoo got him that way again, the rest of the series. And yeah. I was like, see, that's him learning. He's like the, the super sped up version of an evolutionary process or something like that. You know, like he just grows and he learns and he adapts and he gets it so quickly. Mm -hmm. I love watching that kid defend. Yeah, I think a lot of that too is just the the Tyson Chandler thing, like Gotta having be. him having him as a mentor and like I mean they're they're in contact uh, daily. He, he was saying after Game yeah. Six, Lively was. Um, I don't know if you saw that that clip where like coming off the court, going back towards the locker room, yeah. uh, he sees Tyson there and he's like, Oh, I got to get at my pops or whatever. Right. Like it, it really is like that, that kind of almost family like bond, like with them. And he said, uh, and, uh, I don't know if it was his post game interview or if it was like an after practice interview thing. Yeah. Um, but he was talking about how like, yeah, he's talking with, uh, like Tyson and even Sweeney, Sweeney like yeah. every day, like he is in regular contact with them, just trying to absorb as much as he can. And it's like, you know, if there's one guy you're going to take, uh, you know, advice and coaching from defensively speaking, like Tyson's about as good as you can get. Cause yeah, uh, that I'm, I'm really happy that Tyson's been able to have this third chapter, even if it's, you know, post playing days with the Mavericks. Right. Cause yeah. neither of those two times went quite, quite right after, uh, after, after 11, let's do. Yeah. 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 I, I even felt a little bad after the 14 incident, even though like at that point oh, it was right. just like, I don't blame you as much here, but it still stinks that we did that to him again. No. So, yeah. 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 Uh, I didn't like very, that very glad they've been able to hang on to him. Cause yeah, he's a perfect mentor for lively and helping, helping this team. Um, and, I mean, team as a whole, but really helping Lively come into his own. Speaking yeah. of which, the interesting thing here is um, 
with this next round matchup, we have the Thunder to thank for us having Lively because they they That's did the right. trade with them. So yeah. a little bit of full circle there uh, with yep. that. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Thunder. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, this could be particularly interesting as well because in this next round, like with the with the Thunder, they're not as you know for for the size they have with like Chet because they don't have more. Um, I guess size, girth, whatever. Uh, they're not a great rebounding team. Like no. this is this is going to be a really good opportunity for Dallas. Yeah. Um, with that, even though yeah, you're down Maxi for at least three weeks, you are still looking at a situation where you've got a lot of very capable front court options, and then you're getting a little bit of firepower back as well with Hardaway coming back into the mix. I actually was surprised he missed like the full series essentially against the Clippers yeah. with that ankle. Like yeah, it didn't no. look bad when I saw it. Yeah, if he comes back. Uh, then you can put all the conspiracy rumors to bed, right? If he keeps having little things pop up, you're like, oh man, is yeah. kid not wanting to play his guy? His kid like trying <laughs> to cover for THJ. Uh, but yeah, we could use some, some, uh, you know, what I call like the hand of God every once in a while just touches THJ. And if we yep. can get that THJ, dude, that guy is a, a contributor. Like he will, he will, as he has in the past, he can help you win playoff games. If you get the other guy, then uh, then I hope he has a shorter leash than maybe he did during the regular season, right? Yep. Yeah, it's um, oh. there's that maxi fall again. Oh my um, gosh. Yeah, yeah. your your thread had a... Uh, so I, obviously everyone saw the fall and everything, but you had uh, the great clip. Um, I think the one next one on your thread after this, right after it, uh, where he kind of reaches for the ball and then right. you see him kind of grab the shoulder uh, yeah. uh, as if that's the actual like dislocation because mm -hmm. he shot two free throws after this, which seems incredible now when you yeah. dislocate that AC joint. I, yeah, I, I wouldn't be even be surprised if the shoulder wasn't as dislocated at that point. Like, yeah. and the only reason I say this, I have no medical experience, but I, I do have a basketball injury back when I played in high school. I dislocated my shoulder now up to this point over 20 times, my shooting shoulder, my right arm. And um, one of the worst dislocations I ever had was like just spearing my arm out for a, for a bad pass. I just shot yeah. my arm out and the momentum of the ball was so strong. It carried my hand and my shoulder just popped out. And like, so when wow. I saw that play of, of Maxi immediately grabbing his shoulder, like you could tell he was right surprised. Yeah. He was, yeah, he's, he's like, Oh, and, and yeah. like that, that, when I see that, it still DDP, it still kind of gives me chills. Cause like I a hundred percent relate to that moment where he like reaches out for a ball and then it's just grasping for his shoulder. Like he did not expect what happened right there. Right. And uh, that pain. And like, he knows he's done. Like he's walking off. Oh, yeah. right? like, he is done at that moment. And, um, and so, yeah, it, it's a, it's a rough injury when they say he's going to be reevaluated in three weeks. Yeah. Uh, what that means is uh, rest up Maxi and start recovering. We'll see you next season. That, that's yeah, really what I think. Pretty much. Means. Yeah. yeah. And then, and that is a huge loss for them. I know, I know Maxi, he, he's, he gets a lot of flack. I feel like, uh, yeah. and at times I feel like it's overly harsh. I'm like, I understand like he, our front court situation for years of Maxi and Dwight Powell, people are a little burned by that. I get that. Uh, I'm less understanding of the Maxi criticism because yes, he's never going to be a guy that does any kind of stat sheet, like right. standout performance, unless you get like, uh, his game before this game. What was it? Five, where yeah, game or, five is where he, he five where he threes, had yeah. like the yeah when he had like the five threes yep. um awesome stuff but it's at the same yeah. time you're like yeah now you've you know you, you got you have this guy who's very fundamentally sound who helps your defense is versatile he now it's not mm -hmm. like he's as good as he was two or three years ago right. but it's still a very capable um defender who can give you quality minutes having him as a, a backup big is perfect i think at times he's put in uh less than less than a generous position where it's like running the small ball five, like closing out game yeah. five, where it's like, that's like a no win situation to put your player in. Um, because yeah, if he's not able to stay in front of Harden at like the point of attack on that, then he's not going to be able to get up and contest the shot at that point. So you're just kind of putting him in a, in a less than advantageous position. And then he's catching heat from fans mad. He wasn't able to do it. It's like, that wasn't the best option we had. That's just the one we went with. So I think they are going to miss his presence, but. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But at least with this kind of matchup, like we were talking about, you're going to have, I think still an advantage there with the front court um, that you can take advantage of. Like you're going to be able to, to work with that. If Gafford had a trouble, had trouble with the physicality of Zubats, then 
he's going to have a little bit more of an easy time with Chet. Although Chet's a great player too. I love him, but he, he's yeah. just, I mean, you look at him, he's a beanpole. Like he doesn't yeah, have the same. Exactly. Guy. Chet's skill is so different from Zoo's, right? Like yep. Zoo is all bull. He's, he's, he's not like uh, the gazelle and, and, and uh, Chet is like, Hey, I'm super long. No diddy, but like I'm, I've, I'm a high skill player. And so I think someone like that Gafford and lively will be fine against now. He's yeah. still going to get his, he's a really good player. He's a very quality player, uh, but he's not going to beat you up. And that's what Zubak was just doing, right? He was beating yeah. guys up and that's what gave Gafford, especially the hard time. Yeah. I'm curious. Um, as we look at this too, like one of the things is we've just been talking about injuries and all that, Luca's been an interesting case so far through the first round. We you know we know he was dealing with the sprain with the the knee and everything. We know yeah. that he was apparently also like under the weather for the first little bit of that. He had one game where it looked like he was there and in top form. And then the last game was kind of more of what we saw before where right. now he didn't have the, the the conditioning maybe in that that was sort of the the bug or whatever he had um illness, but you know, you do have a guy like Kyrie that's able to go into overdrive. I'm yeah. curious to see, like, is Luca's knee going to be a lingering issue for this team? Or are they going to have, to, you know, are they going to get him a little bit better back where it doesn't have to be Kyrie and just complete uh, Batman mode, essentially um, having to take this over? But yeah. uh, I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on that? Do you what's your feeling, I guess? Here, here's me playing a little bit of Sherlock Holmes, right? Where Luca in a in a post-practice interview or something like that the other day was saying he says it'll probably linger and until he gets the rest he needs and that's probably not until the off season yeah and for luca to come out and say that means that someone with a medical degree told him that right like he's not just going to give that info away unless someone else has already told him that is my guess and yeah. so and so that's probably what they're saying is like hey it's probably one of those kind of sprains where it's like unless something horrible happens you're not going to make it any worse uh it but it's probably not going to get all that much better until you can literally stay off of it for a week or two yeah, uh, and give it the rest it needs. But I did. I agree with you, DDP. I I did think in Game Six he looked way more spry than mm -hmm. he did in a few of the earlier games in the Clippers series, like where he just looked like he was dragging that leg around. Uh, someone posted a, a really funny picture where they'd edited uh, Luca into looking like a pirate with a peg leg, and I was <laughs> like, yeah, that's kind of what it looks like. Here he is. He's the most skilled, most uh, most amazing pirate basketball player we've ever seen because he literally is just playing on one and a half legs. Yeah. And, uh, and so I do think he's going to get better. Um, I think the the Clippers, they like to, to push the game. They have a high pace. I think they were uh, right around the same level in the NBA standings as the Mavericks were on the season at pace. So they both like to push. Yeah. Um, and, and as long as he can keep from dinging it up or getting a knee to knee or something like that, I think, I think about what we've gotten from him and maybe a little bit incrementally better as days go by, but it's not going to, he's not going to be fully healthy. Luca is my fear. Yeah. And so I'm trying to prepare myself for like, okay, is is 90% is is 90% of Luca enough? Now it was to beat the Clippers without Kawhi. I think it could be enough to beat the Clippers. Is it enough uh, the Thunder? Is mm -hmm. it enough to to take you to the promised land? You're just like, oh, I guess we'll ask that question when we get there, right? Let's just yeah. get it. Let's just hope it's enough to get through the Thunder. Yeah. I mean, the good news is even if he's on one leg, as long as he can throw passes like this, <laughs> you're, oh you're gonna gosh. have you you're going to have some fortune in, uh, you're going to, you got the thoroughbreds to go down the floor like Isn't this one's Kyrie, but you know, Derek Jones can do that. PJ Washington can do that. Lively can do that. I yep. think Gafford's even got enough get up Boom. and go that you could do something like that. So Josh Green, absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sugar glider, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. They've, they've absolutely got the guys that can, that can run the floor like that and turn that around. So yeah, if, if you can't get down the floor and run a half court set and get into the paint, at will over and over again, then okay, maybe you can still work around it this kind of way. Maybe you can still uh, hit those leak out passes and transition. And uh, what I love about this clip here is after Harden misses, how quick the Mavericks get a bucket and the camera yeah. goes back to Harden. He's just sitting there, like, just like, well, shit. Yeah. <laughs> like, he's just like, all right, uh, I don't know what to do about that. You know, yeah. like, that's how quickly it can turn on you. And that I think that's just demoralizing for, for an opponent there, especially in that case, the Clippers kind of in the process trying to cut back into the game after the Mavericks came out and pulled away a little bit early, trying to reel it back in. And then a play like that happens. And it's just like, man, anytime they want, they can just throw a, a handful of passes like that and it get away from you again. 
Yeah, and to any Mavs fans who aren't as familiar with the Thunder, one thing I would say is they are a remarkably well coached team. Oh, I think their coach great. is going to win yeah. Coach of the Year, yep. and they they don't like like we've seen historically. Listen, I think Harden. I, I'm not a fan, but I think Harden's going to go down as one of the greatest offensive players of his generation, or or maybe just of all time. Like he's in his prime, he was just unbelievable. Now I don't like the head snap, and I don't like him baiting the call, the calls and all that, but mm-hmm. he was just an incredible offensive player. Paul George at his best, we saw it in Game Four, right? unbelievable shot maker when, when he's on, but yep. both of those guys, both of them could have a little hang dog in them where they'll just hang their head and drop their shoulders. I don't think this thunder team has a lot of that. This right. thunder team is a, is a similar to this Mavs team. And in the sense that they're going to fight until the buzzer sounds. And, uh, and so Mavs fans get, get kind of amped up for that. Cause it is going to be a war. It is going to be a dog fight between these two rosters. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, the Thunder, yeah, their their coaching is great. I, I think that you're right that uh, they're going to win. Their guy's going to win Coach of the Year. Yep. The team is just very well balanced too. Like I know, like a lot of people say, like obviously Shea being uh, probably the runner up for the MVP. But even with that being the case, it's like it's not just him and a bunch of bit players or whatever. In any other year, Chet would be Rookie of the Year. Oh yeah. In uh, in any other circumstance too, like uh. Jalen Williams, uh, J Dub, like he's a legitimate number two option for Dude, them. Like, he is good. They, they are he is so smooth, so balanced, and like, I mean, when you got a million draft picks and you have a track record of like drafting yeah. well, like yep. people might point to the guys that didn't work out. Um, you know, Giddy hasn't been exactly what they hope, but he still has his moments here and there. Right, uh, and then they have other guys that they've taken to a first rounder from like 2020 that they've already cut. And it's like I get it, but the whole point is when you have that many picks available to you, you can you can swing for the fences and say like, well, the player ceiling is this. So you know, if he can hit that, then yeah, then it's a huge steal. But if not, then you know, whatever. We've got a million other picks, so they don't have that same degree of pressure. But yeah, their their team is very stacked and balanced. And it's actually one of the reasons I'm surprised that they're not a little bit better of a rebounding team. But even yeah. with that being the case, I, I really think that the biggest thing I think people look at with them is they're just like, oh, well, they're a young team. They're the youngest team, I think, in playoff history to to win a series. Um, so that's saying something. So people look to sure. like the inexperience. And I get that. But I'm also thinking like they've been incredibly healthy all year. They're incredibly young and well-rested. And, uh, you know, and they got an MVP caliber guy with a great supporting cast. Like this is not, not something I look at, um, and, and say like, oh, this is, this is ideally suited for the Mavericks. Like, no, this is going to be a war. I think, I think this is going to be regardless of who wins. I think it's a six or seven game series. And that's assuming Dallas's health holds up roughly at what it's at right now. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you, you hate to say this as a Mavs fan about to play them, but they're also, Outside of SGA's ridiculously wet whistle, mm-hmm. uh, like they're also an easy team to root for. You know, they yeah. clearly play for each other. Like we said, they're super well coached. They they play a fun brand of basketball. And so, as Mavs fans, we have to amp up our hearts to fill it with sports hatred, so that we can go against them now, right? But like, yep. but but just in isolation, they're they're a fun team, man. And I think our Mavs are a fun team. So it, it's really really going to be interesting to see these two these two styles collide, right? Because both are good defensive teams. I, I think both are very good offensive teams, especially when they're playing their game. Uh, and so we're just going to see who, who's got the, uh, the, 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 the enough to push across the finish line. Paul Pierce, who I don't like admitting that I agree with very often, wow. right? But Paul Pierce, uh, was, was on the air either yesterday or the day before. And it was saying like, Hey, he picked the Mavericks actually in the series. I think he picked them in six, five or six. Yeah. And he said, for me, uh, the OKC Thunder are just still in the package. He said they're, mm-hmm. they're too young. They're unproven. He said, I think that when, you know, they had the easiest matchup in all of the Western playoffs by far, placing the Pels without Zion. Especially no. without, yeah, Zion. Yeah, without yeah. Zion. Now, with Zion, it might have been a different story. It, yeah. it would have been a much tougher matchup. I, I would have still picked them, but mm-hmm. I think it would have been a much, uh, a much more of a dogfight. Um, and so uh, it's interesting to hear people like Paul Pierce go like, hey, you got Kyrie, you got Luca, you got some, you got more experience on the other side of the ball and the map side of everything. And he said, I think, I think this next series is going to tell us a lot about the Thunder. And he picked the Mavs, I think, in five. Hmm. Man, uh, I would love that. I have a hard time seeing oh, yeah. five, but I don't, I, mean, I don't have five. Yeah, I don't have five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, I, I think with OKC, I, I think it's kind of um, not exactly the same because obviously we know, knowing what we know about that 
previous iteration when they were the too young team to do it. They ended up having three, you know, MVPs on that roster eventually. Um, but kind of like in that 2010 season where they faced off 2010, 2011 season, uh, where they first met up with the Mavericks and yeah, that was a five game series, but that thunder team was just so stacked and, um, talented. Now it was a little bit top heavy, like I said, with those MVPs, but you also had guys like Serge Ibaka and all that, that really made Mm -hmm. that a special team. So, if the biggest thing going against them is the inexperience, yeah, that that matters. But to some extent, it can even work for you because you're like you don't you know, know better to be yeah, afraid of the better. moment. Exactly. Yeah, no, nobody's looking to you. Nobody's expecting this of you, and so you're able to go out and you know throw haymakers. And uh, yeah, it's it's kind of open ended. It's a little bit liberating to an extent. Um, so wouldn't surprise me. Um, but yeah, if you, if you can have a play like Gafford playing here on yeah, right. Chet, Chet's going through the backboard, if that's the yeah. case, like well, uh, he, he's going to absolutely steamroll him if he can play with that kind of physicality uh, yeah. with that. And Lively, I think Lively has got a little bit of that um, to him as well. So yep. I'd love to see how Lively does in this matchup with Chet just being, again, um, Chet still considered a rookie. Uh, any other circumstance, he would have been rookie of the yeah. year if it wasn't um, Wimby. But oh, still, uh, Derek Lively, a great, great rookie year as well. And it just seems like he just keeps getting better and better. And credit to Chet, he had a great first round as well. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Chet, Chet's a really solid player, man. I keep waiting for someone to just absolutely abuse him, but I think mm-hmm. he's really smart. He's got like that. He's got the frame that he's taller, longer, all that stuff. But like he's got that frame like uh, Kevin Durant, right? Where it's just yep. like, oh, they're, the, the league's going to break that little guy in half. Never did. Right. Never did. He he knew he knows how to get the most out of his frame and his body instead of letting them abuse him. And I think Chet's kind of figured that out. He's long, he's skinny, he looks like he'd be frail, but I think he's kind of figured out how to to uh, maximize his potential. Now against someone like Zoo or Joker or the you know Embiid, the big big boys that mm-hmm. play down low, he's he's not going to do great against them. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see how our centers, the center matchup, is going to be an extreme extremely important matchup when it comes to Chet versus Gafford and Lively for sure. Yeah, for sure. Another thing that's kind of interesting, uh, and this is from Nick Angstad on Twitter. He points out that OKC allowed opponents to shoot 12.8% of their shots from corner threes in the regular season. Mm. That's 30th, uh, which is the highest percentage allowed in the NBA. So he says, this is definitely a big series for like Derek Jones, Jr. PJ Washington, Josh Green, Dante Exum. And, you know, if, if Hardaway's, informed and like we know the Mavericks a couple years ago when they had their run the corner three was like their bread and butter like they just generated those looks like crazy even Bertans was able to have big playoff games for them uh, I think in that Utah series so yeah you can absolutely take advantage of that and what that would open up for you then um, if you start getting those kind of plays to to knock those down then you have a situation here where you get like Derek Jones going baseline and getting the reverse now OKC You know, they got very capable rim protector with Chet. But if you're able to catch them a little bit flat footed like that, I I like how Gafford's even kind of boxing out, even though it's on Harden on uh, kind of the weak side, kind of holding that lane for him to to get all the way there. Like, yeah, you you open things up like this looks like a relatively routine play at this point um, once Mm -hmm. he gets that step past Powell or past George. Um, So, yeah, you, you can open that up and find some easy baskets if you can get that corner three to, to start dropping for you. And so that, yeah. that's one of those great advanced stats that uh, Nick had. Cause I, I would not have known that stat myself. Otherwise I'll admit. <laughs> oh no, it's a great stat. Yeah. And, and like, once, if you can establish the corner three as a threat, then you know, those defenders are closing out hard yep. and that's where guys like Josh green, uh, Derek Jones, jr. Uh, the PJ, they can, they can beat a closeout. You know, they can absolutely attack a closeout. And, uh, and so I'd love to see that. And then if, if Chet rotates over, which he'd likely be the man to do that, uh, then, then maybe it ends up being a dump off for someone like Gafford or Lively. Yeah. I mean, it absolutely opens up possibilities for, for the Mavericks in that point of attack. And the less you have to ask of Luca and Kyrie in terms of like being like special, special for you to win games, mm-hmm. the better. Cause Kyrie has been for most of the playoffs. Well, now we know in the regular season, he was the, the best uh, fourth quarter closer, like in terms of like points. Um, oh, it's just crazy for sure. And we, you know, whatever the absurdity of the clutch award going to a team that didn't perform well in the clutch uh, for Curry, <laughs> but Kyrie effectively is like the best closer from this past season. Yeah, but in the first half, he he wasn't that 
you know, usually his damage was in the second half and it mm-hmm. complemented well because Luca was, I think, at one point, I don't know if he finished the year that way, but at one point he was like the the leading scorer like in the first half. Uh, mm-hmm. and Kyrie was the leading scorer in the second half, like oh, that's awesome. so it yeah. was just a perfect pairing there. And then especially when both of them have that that ability to take over a game down the stretch as well. But Yep. I, I would like to see Kai, especially with Luca being a little bit hampered. I'd like to see him assert himself a little bit more. I thought yeah. there was a great uh, look at that we saw in game game four. Um, no, I'm trying to remember when they went back to LA. Um, definitely it, game five. Uh, well, they lost game one? five, right? But they won in LA, so they. No, let me think about this. I can remember this. They lost game one because kid. No, they lost game, game one ones. and game game four. They lost one and yeah, four. Yeah, that's that's what it was. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, but Kyrie had a great game in there. Uh, I guess it was in game two then, uh, where he came out and immediately got going early. Just a couple baskets, nothing crazy, but just something to kind of establish. Because so many times in the series, you'd have him going like one of five in the first half for two points. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I know you're a great closer, but in a couple of these games, we're digging ourselves humongous holes that we're trying to then climb out of. We we can't wait until the hole's been dug to, to get going. Like we have to, you know, I, I know he says he tries to let the game come to him and not force the issue, but it's like, mm-hmm. ah, at some point you do got to force it a little bit. Cause if, if you're in a, in one of those games, you're down 29 and in another game, you were down 31. Like that's just not surmountable or it should have been it, it was in one case but right. um that's just not practical in that so getting him going a little bit early on and not having to demand as much of luca is probably for the best of the more you can preserve him but i expect okc will keep going after him and yeah, they're gonna hunt him for sure yeah i mean anybody would regardless even yeah. without the the knee and all of that but Maybe to the extent um, that experience of the first round playing against the Clippers where that could help you a place where that is similar. You mentioned uh, SGA's whistle that he gets having to go against guys like Harden in particular could be a good tune up for that. You know, just an uh, experience with another guy that draws those kind of whistles. So you're already kind of on your guard for how you have to be very careful with your body, your hand positioning. Yep. Derek Jones Jr. Showing you can't even touch a ghost on the floor. Otherwise, you're going to be called for a foul. Yep. So, man, can we just stop and just acknowledge how awesome Derek Jones Jr. was in that series? Oh, <laughs> like, so man, good. he was so good. Now, I know he's been de- defending his butt off all year, but like, he just stepped it up. You know, he was taking the challenge of Harden or Paul George all series long. And just made made their lives miserable. I mean, what was it? Game four where they just went insane. I think they yeah. shot 62% from three by the end yep. of the game or something insane like that. Uh, and so, but they're great players. You got to tip your cap to great players, right? Yeah. Sometimes great players are going to beat you hitting ridiculous shots. And in game four, they did. But man, his defense has just been smothering. On one of the broadcasts, uh, JJ Redick was like, hey, you know, we talk about guys like Lou Dord and other elite perimeter defenders. He said, I think we're going to have to start adding Derek Jones Jones Jr. to that list. And yep. I was like, that's right. I love hearing a, a national broadcast team acknowledge Derek Jones Jr. because he absolutely had a strong case uh, for being an all defensive team guy. I know he didn't have enough minutes to technically qualify, which I think is crazy because uh, yeah. he started so many games. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, his game is, is so great. To have him on a minimum, I really, I really hope the Mavs can lock him in long term. Yeah, and I think it was uh, Mavs CBA had a, a good breakdown mm-hmm. of that the other day. I shared it on um, the Prospect YouTube page, just in the the community tab. Um, the the different ways in which Dallas could hang on to him. It, it, it's a little bit tricky, um, but I'm hoping that he's found enough of a home here uh, with Dallas because you know this is what fifth team in like an eight year career so far. Mm-hmm. Um, so the fact is, like, yeah, he he was already adding that three point shot a little bit with Chicago, but it really, he found a spot for himself here. And it's not even just what he brings to the table in terms of that mentality and that toughness. You know, we talked about uh, his quote after, I guess it was game four where he was talking about um, basically he wasn't supposed to be here and everything like going undrafted, bouncing around a guy that uh, wasn't really given a lot of minutes and opportunity in different places and he's just kind of kept with it. And now he's an integral part of a, a really good team in the playoffs. So yep. that's, that's awesome. And the fact that he's been able to get the kind of spacing and help affect the culture the way he has, 
like PJ and Gafford, they get a lot of credit in this defensive turnaround. But yeah, yeah. absolutely. A lot of credit has to go as well to Derek Jones Jr. That that was to me like the Exum signing when it happened. I was kind of like, OK, low risk, high reward potentially. Sure. But Derek Jones Jr. I was like, oh, no, no, no. I've wanted this dude for like two years already on this team, like two or three the years. High flyer. Yeah. The Mavericks, uh, one of those, when it would have been a trade for um, Dragic uh, from the Heat at the time. Oh, that's right. It fell through. That deal fell through. That's right. The Mavericks say they thought that Derek Jones Jr. was going to be included in the deal. They thought it was agreed to, and it felt, yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. So they they had him on their radar for a while, too. And instead, yeah. he ends up going to Chicago for a year right. or so. And uh, he was a high priority for them. They wanted to keep him, but he instead comes to Dallas and is just huge to it. And he's played hurt, and he still managed to be effective playing hurt. Now, uh, what, what he's able to bring in terms of his energy, his athleticism, the fact that he's just capable enough of a three-point shooter and all of that, yep. it's just... Yep incredibly vital to the overall thing here. PJ was great. And PJ had his standing on business moment that became That's a right. Meme. Yeah, but absolutely. Derek Jones Jr. Absolutely deserves every bit as much, if not even a tiny bit more credit, I feel like. And that's no well, disservice to PJ. I just think no, no, Jones I, was that good. I think we need to lump those three guys into the conversation when we talk about who deserves so much credit because it was literally the uh, move by Kid, right? The mm -hmm. insertion of Gafford and Derek Jones Jr. into the starting line, lineup that really initiated the new identity, the defensive identity. Like yep. once... Uh, Gafford and Derek Jones Jr. were inserted into the starting lineup. The Mavs went on a 16 and two run in the next 18 mm -hmm. games. Where, and that's where, when you look at all the stats, both the, the counting stats and the an analytics, the Mavs just skyrocketed to the top of every category. Basically, they had the number one defensive rating over those 18 games. They had uh, either the, I think they were a top two or three offensive rating in those 18 games. Like they were just a transformed team. And how how do you parcel out the credit oh this guy gets this much credit who knows but you got to acknowledge that, yeah. that that making Derek Jones Jr. a starter along with Gafford was a huge part of changing this team's identity into what it is today oh 100% 100% yeah. absolutely uh it kind of reminds me of the I think it was a trade made in like the 2009-2010 season that Washington trade that was sending out Josh Howard but you brought in mm. uh Hayward and you brought in Deshaun yep. Stevenson and Carl sure, Butler. Steve. So that was a similar thing. Three guys coming in. Uh, now at the time we thought that it's funny for a minute, we almost wanted to pencil in like, Oh, is uh, Brendan Haywood the best center of the Mavericks have ever had just shows that they hadn't had a lot of great centers. Uh, yeah. And then Tyson shows up and completely changes that conversation immediately. Yeah. But Deshaun Stevenson, even like the title team uh, was huge for them in that and mostly in the finals. But uh, and Butler didn't get a chance to even play in that actual run, but right. he was still your second best player. Those are three guys that I think contributed in a big way to the culture change. So while that yeah. was all one trade from one team, you still have the Wizards here because of uh, because of Gafford's original team. So yeah. you have that interesting kind of parallel as well. But yeah, three guys coming in and just immediately changing the, the culture and the identity of the team for sure and leading to a, a major transformation. Yeah, I completely agree. Absolutely. Let's see here. I'm just looking over some of the notes. So shout out, first of all, to our people in the house here. TGK, what's good? Aaron M. What's up, everybody? Uh, I still have not seen how long is the kitty at contract. All right. Nice. That's vicious. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Lockbox ENT. What's good? Uh, let's see. Yeah, if you guys got a question, feel free to throw it in the comments. Um, you can either at the Dallas Prospect or at DDP. Just helps me see it a little easier. Jack says two Lamborghinis. I think we got a Lamborghini and a Humvee. <laughs> it's yeah, like Kyrie's the Lambo and Luca's the Humvee. I think that. There you go. Yeah, no, that, that's fair. That is fair. Um, so some of the stats I was looking at from that uh, OKC was the top three point shooting team from the regular season. From what I was mm -hmm. seeing, uh, thirty eight point nine percent in the regular season as a team. That's pretty remarkable. The Mavericks, meanwhile, 36.9% looks very close, obviously 2%, but it's the difference of first versus 18th. So, right. and we, and we saw the three point drought, shall we say of the first series. Um, and, and even in that game where Maxi went wild, it was basically like Maxi and Derek Jones had like six of like the team's nine makes or something like that. And that was just like Luca and Kyrie hitting a couple late. It felt like, so yeah, like 
the Mavericks three point shooting has been a, a challenge in the, in the first round. OKC with their size and everything. Yeah. Chet can obviously do it too, but that's something that you have to consider is, you know, the Clippers did burn you like scorch you in a couple of those games shooting the three. And one of them, it just didn't matter what you were doing. Paul George was going to yeah. throw it in left-handed falling out of bounds from the opposite yeah. end of the court. And it was going to yeah. be nothing but net. Yeah. A lot of those were very well contested shots. Now they had yep. a few open, but a lot of them were, you can't play defense better than that. You just, you just go, well, I guess you made it my guy. Yep. And the Clippers, you know, they're, they're very close to OKC in that uh, team three point percentage as well. They were phenomenal yeah, great. Uh, in the regular yeah. season. So just saying that's another thing to be, weary of in this in this first round matchup here and uh okc's points per game was 120.1 mavericks at 117.9 again i always feel a little bit more iffy on that particular type of stat for dallas because as we mentioned they had a drastic overhaul at the midway point so it's kind of hard to draw that more broad uh conclusion from that but if, if you look at them after the deadline, the rest of the way, I think these teams are closer matched for sure in that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you have to add that nuance, right? Yeah. You have to you have to acknowledge how injured this Mavericks team was. Like unbelievable. Like, mm-hmm. like really, like th- this this second round series between the Thunder and Mavs is the healthiest team last season. And of all the good teams, at least the most injured team of all the good, there, there was some like scrub teams that were just as injured as the Mavs, but yeah. they didn't do anything. But of good teams, the Mavs were the most injured team by far missing stars and starters. Uh, and so the idea that the, the Thunder only finished with seven more games than the Mavericks did is I think that's almost a testament to how good the Mavericks team is, right? Like yeah. they, how many more wins would they have had if they were the team in those last 20 games all season? Yep. If you want to tell me it would be five, I'd go, oh, easily. If you want to say it'd be seven and we'd have tied the Thunder, I'd be like, easily. If you wanted to say it'd have been nine, I'd have said, yeah, I could buy into that because that team was just so much better than the team we had before the All-Star Bake, before the trade den- deadline, right? That team was just kind of floundering, just yeah. finding wins based basically on, Luca. can you single-handedly get us a win tonight? And mm-hmm. a lot of nights, to his credit, Luca was like, I got you. You know, yep. like he was unbelievable all season, of course. But in that first half, like when the team was, everyone else was injured, there's Luca going like, okay, I, I'll strap it on and we'll, we'll get this win. I'll, I'll bring this W home for us tonight. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the teams are remarkably close. I think that, I think the two teams are way closer than a lot of Thunder fans would be willing to admit, to be honest. Yeah, and I think what they're looking at in large part is uh, Lou Dort, which to be fair, Luca has numerous times credited Lou Dort as one of the the hardest defenders to go against in the league. Sure. Like the the Dortcher chamber is real. <laughs> the Dortcher uh, chamber. I've never heard that. That's great. Oh uh, yeah, that that's an OKC fan nickname for him. Uh, the Dortcher chamber. Uh, absolutely appropriate. Um, because yeah, when he when he battens down the hatches, man, it, it's so difficult to get anything going. That's all the more reason why I think you need Kai able to to get going early for this because yeah the the thunder uh, the thunder with that team with that youth and with that home crowd because okc especially when the team is good that's one of the hardest places to play in the league yeah um so having to go into that kind of environment and a game where luca might be really pressed and having to deal with the physicality and the relentlessness of it yeah derrick jones jr phenomenal defensively i don't know what the the distance is between him and dort but Dort is a phenomenal defender. Um, I, I feel like he's a better defender than like Paul George, who gets a lot of credit, obviously, uh, for his defense. And so having to deal with that is already going to somewhat lim- limit Luka, I think, especially with the knee, if it's not where it needs to be. So you're going to have to find ways to, to kind of work around that. Um, and to, to your point earlier, talking about how these teams are very different. And if you kind of, took the second half of the season for the new look Mavericks and uh, just drew that out over the course of the season. How different would it look kind of like the Clippers matchup last round? You, you really can't draw anything from these previous matchups because yeah, OKC won all but one of those games. But on that first game was December 2nd, Dallas, the starters. Uh, this is like what you were saying. It was Luca, Seth Curry, mm-hmm. Derek Jones, Jr. Grant Williams and lively uh, Lawson was also, led the team from the bench in terms of minutes. <laughs> Kyrie, Josh, Exum, Tim, and Maxi were out. Yep. And in that game, Luca still went 36, 18, and 15, while Lively had 20 and 12. And Dallas lost by six. If you recall, uh, despite the fact that they had a 30-point comeback, a 30-0 oh. run, 
um, and still lost that game. Uh, th- that's just amazing. It's sort of similar to what just happened with the Clipper game, uh, game five, but yep. yeah, uh, just incredible stuff there. And then yeah. uh, that next match was the first game against, uh, it was the first game for Gafford and PJ and Dallas blew them out blew by them, 35. Blew the doors off the hinges, yeah, yep. absolutely. And the last yeah. game, nobody played. No one played. Yeah. So you, you, uh, what I have in my notes here is the head to head matchups between these two teams. You got to throw them out. Just throw them out. Luca missed two of the games. Kyrie missed two of the games. They alternated when they were missing. So it's like, we never had our full complement of players. And, you know, except for that one game, maybe where we did blow them out, but, but that's not all. That also is not indicative of how I think the series is going to go. We're not going to blow the doors off of the thunder, right? They're too good for that. Um, but it does show you that like, hey, if the Mavs are hot, this is what a hot game could look like from the Mavs because they're going to play that stellar defense. And when they're hitting shots, they're just going to beat anybody. Because I think, I don't know about you, DDP, I think the defense is a given. We've seen yeah. it over the last 25 games or so, including the, the, these these six in the playoffs. They are going to play great defense. That's mm-hmm. who they are. It's not like relying on three-point shooting, which comes and goes. Even if you're a good three-point three point shooting team, it comes and goes, right? There's always that wave of variance. But if yeah. you're a defensive-minded team, you can bank on that every single night. And mm-hmm. so I think the Mavs are going to get out there and play that tough defense. Now, the thing is, the Thunder play tough defense too, right? They're a really solid defensive team yep. as well. And, and to go back to your comment on Lou Dort versus Luka, I think it's really interesting because you you kind of compared and contrasted uh, Dort versus Paul George on Luka. And it's interesting because George defends you with length and speed, mm-hmm. foot speed, things like that. And, and Dort is is basically a free safety playing in the NBA, right? Like he's yeah. just a big guy who's who's long. He's not tall. He's like six four or so. And mm-hmm. if he's six four, I think he's probably six three. You know, like that, right. that's what they say, right? And so like, but he's just out there. He's gonna body you and body you and body you. Mm-hmm. And so like I, I honestly like Luca against physical defenders. Like now he has given Lou Dort credit, but also in the two games he played against the Thunder, he averaged his season average 34 points. So yeah. it's not like they stifled him when he played him this season. It's not like, Oh no, here's the Thunder. I, I'm going to, you know, uh, perform well below my, uh, my averages. No, sure. he, he gave them his averages. He was, yeah. he was very much Luka Doncic, even against Lou Dort. And so I, I don't see it as like, like I remember in Luka's first couple of years, back when Ben Simmons was still a thing, mm-hmm. there was a few games where, where Simmons really stifled Luka in a couple of games where you're like, Oh dang, like this, this, this guy's quicker than Luka. He's strong. Like Luka, he's, yep. he's taller than Luka. And I, you could just see like, Oh, I can see why Luka's having to figure it out. Right. Um, but I, I think I think Dork I think Dork's going to get handled. If 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 Luca's knee is feeling better, I, 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 as like all Mavs fans are, I'm betting the house on Luca. Right? I, I, he's going to win that matchup. Dork will make it hard. He is extremely physical, and yeah. of course, the playoff whistle favors extremely physical defenders. But I think the Mavs will be like, oh, you're going to let us play physically. Awesome. Just let us play physically on that uh, that that skinny kid over there wearing number two, that yeah. SGA. Like let let us play physical as well, and it'll all go okay. And so uh, we'll see if they let us let us get physical with their little superstar. That'll be interesting to see because, yeah, it's so far throughout this uh, postseason. Like the Clippers series was very physical, unless yeah. it was oh, yeah. regarding James Harden. <laughs> if it yeah. was regarding Harden, then it was like, yeah, you, you breathe in his zip code and it's a foul. And yeah, so if you're dealing with that, you have foul trouble for key guys that could very much impact this series uh, for Dallas. And, and I think the reason I have more hesitation still about Luka. Because, yeah, yeah you're, to your point, he was phenomenal in the regular season, even against OKC. He still got sure. his averages against Dort. But it's still one of those things of, like, those are isolated one-off appearances versus an entire series condensed down into that, and he's coming mm-hmm. in with the knee. So it's like, the knee when you're thing. facing a Dort for a five, six, seven-game series, yeah. that will wear and tear on you more than just catching them in a, you know, on a Tuesday in fe- February or something, you know? Yeah, possibly, um, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's one one thing that still concerns me there. And that's why I think the role players are huge. You have to get similar performances from PJ and Derek Jones Jr. I think you have to get Exum finally doing something here. Um because you're you're just gonna have to find enough guys that can chip in here and there that it doesn't put all the weight on Luca and Kyrie. Because if they gotta shoulder all of the weight, then I think it becomes problematic uh for Dallas as the series goes on. Um because I, I just don't want to put that much on Luca's shoulders at this point if we don't have to. I, I wish 
I wish there was a way that he could almost play off the ball more, let Kai run the point a little bit more and kind of pick and choose his spots. But it feels like every game is, okay, Luke is going to go out there and spend about a quarter feeling things out, trying to mm-hmm. get himself going a little bit. And then yeah. when he goes to the bench, then we got Kyrie kind of taking over. But I, taking over is just running the offense essentially because usually he doesn't start really getting aggressive looking for a shot until the second half. So yeah. I, I guess I want them to change up their approach a little bit from what we saw in the first round. But that kind of felt like a continuation of what their tendencies were all year. Yeah, well, I I completely agree. And I would say starting in game five, we saw the Mavs in the first half have Kyrie start bringing the ball up more often, right? And like you said, he didn't shoot a ton just because he's got this, he's got this mindset of like, I get mine in the, in the final 24. Uh, but, but he, he was leading the actions, right? Which I think is great. I think it's a really good coaching decision by the Mavs coaching staff. Start with Mm -hmm. head coach kid, right? But like, because it puts Luca at different spots on the floor. It puts him it, it puts him closer to the rim. It puts him more on the sideline. It puts him closer to like post up situations. And so I really like the idea of having Luca uh, Kyrie bring the ball up more often uh, because I think it makes the game a little easier for Luca and I think it takes probably a little bit more of the stress off of that knee for Luca. Oh yeah, because Dort's one of those guys. He'll pick you up full court every yeah. possession. So. He will beat you up the whole yeah. way. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So if if you can save yourself that eighty feet or whatever, let's say seventy feet, because uh, if you're not bringing up the ball, then he's probably not going to have to hound you too physically until you get like to the half court set at least. So if you can avoid that extra wear and tear, even like that'll add up over time, where it, it's just less of a beating you have to take. So yeah, uh, I'll be curious to see how these two benches. Uh, balance essentially. I I thought I had a stat saved on my phone earlier, but I was trying to find it and I couldn't. Uh, I was it was regarding OKC's bench scoring versus Dallas's, and I'll, oh. I'll have to see if I can Dig find it. If, if some maybe someone in the comments, if you happen to have seen that and know where I'm going with this, uh, feel free to remind me because. I remember thinking like, that's good. I'm going to save that. And now I can't find it. So <laughs> it happens. rather, rather than just completely talk out of my ass about it, I'm going to hold off on actually bringing it up more than gotcha. I have until I find it. Gotcha. But yeah. Um, let's see. Well, I guess look for that for a second. Uh, what, what's the next factor you kind of look at for this series uh, for Dallas? All right. So I've got, yeah, X factors are key questions I've got, right? So I've got, we've already discussed it, but the the first one that came to my mind was the Gafford and Lively matchup versus Chet. That I think that's going to be a central matchup. Yep. A huge part of the Mavs winning over the last quarter of the season where we were just blowing and going and just knocking everyone around wasn't the three-point shooting. We were extremely average from three while we were going on that 16 to two run over the, the final 18 games of the season. Yes. We, were, yep. we were, I think we're shooting like 30, under 37%. We were 36. Yeah, it was like 36. Yeah, something like that. But it was the Gafford Lively getting all of those dunks, all those layups, all those easy baskets, which, like we said earlier, takes so much pressure off of Luka and Kyrie. If off of the pick and roll, we're getting those lobs and dunks and, and, and you know, off the glass bank shots from our big guys, it takes so much. It makes the defense mind go like, well, we can't just focus on those two because yep. we know when, I, when that guy picks me and he's going to come screen me, it's going to happen again and again and again and again and again. He's also a threat. And so if my guy behind me doesn't rotate i'm gonna look like the fool right and so and and once again the thunder have a good defensive team and a good defensive system but you can't jump as high as daniel gafford you're not going to jump as high as Derek lively no one on the thunder can contest outside of chet is going to be really great at contesting those lobs if they're even just a a fraction out of position and you know that luca especially but luca and Kyrie, they got that pinpoint lob touch with those two they've got that perfect chemistry with gafford and lively to where they yeah. can put the ball where only those big guys can go get it. And so if Chet's not in the play, because Chet is so long and he is, he is good at defending the lob, but if they screen him out of the play mm-hmm. and, the, and the defender has to come over and rotate over, it's either going to leave one of our big men to have a really good shot at a lob, or it's going to leave someone in the corner, what we already talked about, someone in the corner open for three. And yep. so that that action, that whole, what does the, 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 the Gafford and Lively versus Chet matchup end up looking like? If we get the better of that, I think we win the series. And I, I don't mean to oversimplify it, but I really yeah. do. If we get the better of that game in and game out, game in and game out, I think the Mavs, I think that's a sign 
mean that the Mavs are winning strategically, right? If right. they can't shut that down, because I thought the Clippers did a pretty good job of they shutting did. down the lobs in several games. Now, mm -hmm. there's a few where we got loose and we had, you know, like a 10 dunk game or whatever. Yep. But but I thought they they contested really well. But they're also extremely long, extremely athletic defenders. And I'm not I, the, the Thunder are, are, are good defenders, but I don't think they have the same level of length that the Thunder uh, that the the, the uh, Clippers were throwing our way. And so yeah. that, that's the starting point was things I'm looking at. Uh, also, Chet in the first round ag against the, uh, the, the Pelicans yep. only shot 30% from three. He had a really yeah. bad three-point shooting uh, series. And, and pretty uh, the, the team as a whole kind of shot their averages for the most part, but mm -hmm. both SGA and Chet, who were two of their big guns, were bad from three. And I thought that, I that's worth noting. It is. I, I think he defended really well in that series too, yeah. though. So I think that's sort to. of the trade off for him was blocking yeah. shots in particular. He he did a phenomenal job in yeah. that first series. I've, I've got him at two two point seven five blocks, so yep. just under three blocks a game in that series. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so this isn't exactly what I was looking at earlier, but it looks like the Mavericks were eleventh in bench scoring. The Thunder were thirteenth. So just towards the back end of like that upper half of the league, essentially. Um, I think the stat I had though is looking at it again more in that post trade deadline thing, which would have been more useful data here, but it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So at the very least, these are two teams that are kind of middle of the pack on that. I'll be curious to see how Dallas is able to handle um, with the bench. I, I think Exum needs a, a big series here because there were a handful of plays oh, maybe man, in the first so round, nice. but I really thought he was going to offer a lot more. I, I actually, too. in my preview of the series had him as like, I gave for both teams, like, here's who I think is going to be an X factor for this team. And, you know, even for the Clippers, like, here's what I think here. Yep. Um, lot, uh, that was really the one prediction that I felt. I was like, okay, I missed that one. Uh, I thought Exxon was going to be uh, <laughs> bigger on that. I thought he was going to do more to bother Harden um, yeah, while you, also offering some timely three point shooting. You missed it, but so did everybody else. The, if you would have come and told us, Mass fans, or told me as a Mass fan, hey, you know, the most reliable support player you've had all season is going to disappear in the first round of the playoffs, you'd have been like, no, not Exum. He, yeah. he, he's really, he is Mr. Steady Eddie. Like he just, he does what he does against any opponent. He's not going to blow you away. He's not dynamic, but he is steady and he hits open shots and you can take that to the bank. Yep. Except that you couldn't for six <laughs> games against the Clippers in round one. Your check just, would it was bounce. mind blowing. Yeah, absolutely. It's just shocking, shocking yep. that he didn't show up. Yeah. I liked that play and it was one of the ones you had on, um, on your thread there of the, the 34 plays from game six. Mm -hmm. Um, that was that was really sweet where he catches the ball on a fast break and kind of does like a little spin move off the block to get yep. away from. I'm trying to remember who was defending him on the I play. Don't remember, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just a great move like that in transition. It's like it doesn't have to be anything like no. blazing. It can be more of a shifty move, yep. just something like that to get an easy bucket. I know there were a couple times he tried pull up jumpers that just weren't dropping. That was a pretty good shot for him in the first uh, throughout the season. Yep. Um but there were also moments where I saw where I was like, man, he looks like timid on like shooting the three when the opportunity is there, whether it was yeah. him throwing an extra pass into the corner where it's like you had it too, if you wanted, I know sometimes like, Oh, the right pass is to keep the ball moving. Yeah. But it's like, if you got the opportunity there, that's probably a shot you should be looking to take. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to see him make sure he settles in and has confidence He's not, he's not like Josh Green on confidence. Josh Green confidence is, oh my gosh, man, it, it's like, uh, it's like a little <laughs> dough. Like it's more scared of you than you are of it. And <laughs> like, if you, if you breathe too loud around him or something like that, he's going to run away like, and hide. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All of a sudden he's clanking it off the side of the backboard or oh something. And it's like, Josh, or you'll notice like he'll pick up a hitch in his shot, like where it's not a smooth, fluid motion. And you're like, Josh, come on, man. Like yeah. you, you do so many other things very well. Like, Settle in, breathe. Like, yep. I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. It's the weirdest thing. Like when he's on, yeah, he's, he's really nice. You're like, Hey, so there's helpful. the full three and D package. He's got it. Right. And then you see moments like that where you're just like, man, come on, dude. Like at, at the very least be confident with it. Tim Hardaway Jr. Goes through ice, you know, ice droughts or whatever as well. That's like just where he's he just yeah. missing everything, but at the but very it's not least because of confidence. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. He, he shoots every shot as if he's 10 for 10 and he's yeah. just on a heat check. Nope. Uh, Josh green, meanwhile, misses a couple and he's just like, you know what? I don't think I'm going to shoot for a few games. Like, yeah. Kid, kid, come on. Well, yeah. not kid, but well, maybe kid. Young but, man. Uh, sure, kid. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm old enough to call him a kid. Yeah. I, I, yeah, exactly. I'm with you. <laughs> I, I was branching it to Jason kid there. Like, oh, kid. Jason oh, kid. kid. The extra yeah. D. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Got yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Asen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, can I throw a fun stat at you? 
Sure, always. Because right, so, I think this is interesting because a lot has been made, and rightly so, of the continuity and the health that the Thunder have had this year. Yep. And their starting five had the second most minutes of any starting five, of any li- five-man lineup in all of the NBA. The mm-hmm. only five-man lineup what was uh, that had more than them was Denver's starting five. Hmm. Uh, and so it's, it's almost uh, like it's a not coincidental that those are the top two teams in the I West. I mean, heck yeah. Hey, health equals quality play, right? Yeah. From your stars. And so it's, it's SGA, Dort, Giddy, Williams, and Chet. They had 799 minutes together. And wow. man, they absolutely throughout the regular season, just beat up other teams starting lineups uh, mm-hmm. in, in their 799 minutes together. They had a net of, 10.2. So they're beating other teams' starting lineups by 10.2 points per 100 possessions. They are kicking your starters' butts. Wow. But, but, because that's really impressive, right? That's really impressive. L- let me share us another stat with you, though. Here's another stat. The Mavs' most played lineup, well, we didn't quite get to 799 minutes like they did. Our <laughs> most played lineup was Luca, Kyrie, Derek Jones Jr., PG, and Gaffer. That's the, the new lineup, right? Yep. Um, that lineup only got 176 minutes together. So not nearly as much, but some quality playing time together. And their net was 15.5. Yep. So that starting lineup was absolutely demolishing other teams' starting lineups. So he, so really, a lot of the battle, and I think you said this too, a lot of the battle uh, of this series is going to be like, whose bench is really going to play? Whose bench is going to play? Because the starters for both of these teams, they ready and they ain't scared. Like they are going to do what they do. They're going to show up and they are going to fight. It is going to be a brawl. It is going to be a war. And so really it's going to come down to is Josh Green hitting threes or is it Isaiah Joe hitting threes? Is it, you know, it's that kind of stuff. It's good. Who's support player? That's why I know we're not going to cry about it, but that's why the loss of Maxi, who was playing so well, it's, it's really powerful. It's really really rough. We really need to see Exum show up like you were talking about. Without Maxi, uh, who was shooting really well from three in the Clippers series, over 50%, uh, mm-hmm. we need Exum to kind of fill that fill that gap, right? To No Diddy. We need him to fill that hole, right? No Diddy. We need him to step up and be who he was all season because he shot, I think, better than 50% from three or right at 50% from three in the regular season. And we need that Dante Exum to show up. We need the Josh Green, who was a 40 or better than 40% corner three-point shooter in the regular season to show up. We need those guys to hit the threes. If if Timmy Hardaway's playing, we need him shooting from the threes because he's a he's a 40% corner three-point shooter. We need him hitting those shots because that's, I think, a lot of where the series is going to come down to. These starting lineups are going to go to war. We need the support players to step up for the Mavs in a huge way. Oh, for sure. And uh, I'll be interested to see because in those matchups that we have seen uh, this season with OKC and the the Mavericks they've Giddy has really struggled in those games um and it's just one of those guys that like he doesn't have any kind of consistent three-point shot and so I'm curious to see if Dallas challenges him the same way if they're basically just like look you set up there wide open you shoot your three see see what's happening there kind of try and give him the Russell Westbrook treatment um now he he can fill up a, a triple double for you but it's it's also one of those things that his his offensive game is pretty limited. Yep. Uh, nice playmaker, but definitely something that I think Dallas could hunt a little bit there for him. Um, but they do also have, um, I think, Kaysen off the bench. Their their rookie. I think he might have yeah, been Kaysen Wallace. Yeah, yeah. Part of, was he part of that same trade back that he, he was the D the life trade. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. So interesting that he's kind of finding his rhythm a little bit here uh, at the same point because yeah, he he. He's definitely been uh, was good for them, um, and what I saw in that first round. Yeah, one stat that I that in my in my kind of research that I found a little troubling, and you you just hope you hope it's that hot or cold thing that Giddy can do, because while Chet and SGA were really bad from three in this series, mm-hmm. Giddy hit fifty percent of his threes, and he was taking like four and a half a game. Okay. And so we need that uh, to go on a cold streak ASAP. Yeah, yeah. Ch- challenging my immediate point. I, l- I respect it. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I guess I, I guess it didn't dawn on me that he was shooting them that well. Um, well but your, your point was correct. He's not a good yeah. three-point shooter, but he just got hot in that series. Well, hopefully the extended breast throws him off a little bit then because yeah. four-game sweep, they've, they've had some time. That's one of those things, too, with a, a young team. Like, yes, they are well-rested, and because of their already youth, they didn't really need rest. No, but those young legs. rest can, um, you know, can lead to rust. So 
hopefully guys like him that had found a little bit of rhythm and momentum, hopefully that's able to be broken up now uh, with this extended delay as they wait for this. Cause it's been definitely um, a minute since they played like a meaningful game again. And they right. get their, their team and their vibe and everything. Like I know people think that they're like kind of corny or whatever with all their, their bark and stuff they do and all that. And like, right. I get it. But at the same time, I'm just like, if nothing else, I see like the whole team is together on that. They, I feel they like their culture in. is similar yeah. to the Mavericks yeah, they fully bought in. bought in. And they're like, look, even if other teams or fan bases think this is lame thing that we do, like we love it. Our fans love it. And, uh, the team rallies around it. So it's like, yeah, I can't fault you for it. You're having success while doing it. So go oh, be a goof no. if it works. Oh, no, be pragmatic. Do what works. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. hundred percent. So, uh, let's see here. I was trying to see if I had any other, points or stats i saw somebody ask the question if uh hardaway coming back could have a similar impact i think it was really uh to uh maxi's three-point shooting uh maxi was what like 10 of 18 in that first yeah. round 10 of 19 yeah, something like that like yeah over over 50 like um so yeah I'll, I'll be real interested to see i don't know if he if he'll be able to bring that to the table but like if, if you got tim hardaway jr on and like on a burner Mm-hmm. You, you you can chalk it up to a borderline win automatically. You just like let him shoot. Got, yeah, yeah, let him it, shoot you to a win. Absolutely. Yeah, if you've got Luca and Kai doing Luca and Kai things, and mm-hmm. then you've got Hardaway going nuts, it's over. And it, I kind of talked about that with um, even Maxi. Uh, bef- I think it was actually before the five three game or whatever when when we were talking about him as an unsung hero from game two. Uh, just his impact and what he's able to bring. It's like look you might not have these kind of shooting outbursts from them often, but if you, if you do have it, you absolutely have to cash that check because you can't count on it to be there all the time. Like if it's there, you get, you got to capitalize on it. And so now fortunately with Hardaway, you will get more of those kind of games than with Maxi, but um, you know, Hardaway you'll get, he that's like that stinks too because the first half of the year he was actually doing really well. He was and, really solid for long stretches of the first half of the season. Yeah, absolutely. yes. So I, I know we're kind of prisoners of the moment, but it feels like it's been so long since he had like a really really good game. So hopefully he can come back and give them that co- kind of lift because especially in a series like this, I think you're going to you're going to need that firepower off the bench. Uh, uh, I absolutely agree. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, Frank, uh, we mentioned kid getting his extension. I don't know the details on it now, although I guess I can take a quick second to check Twitter. I suppose that would work. (laughs) Um, but yeah, uh, kid gets a new multi-year deal. I don't yet see the details on it. It's just hearing that he received the extension today and, uh, is going to sign it up. Uh, yeah, no, even the official statement from the Mavericks isn't talking about the years or anything like that. So that's interesting. I wonder if they've just got it like in principle and they're still hashing it out later, but yeah, I mean, you get two 50 win seasons and three years with him coaching. And in the 10 years before that we had one 50 win season. So that alone was probably going to do it. Not to mention you had the West finals run and now you've won a playoff run in his second playoff thing. If he can ever win a game one, he'll have the total package. Uh, I think your mic went out. It's totally fair for a kid to get a coaching extension, whether you're a fan of his or not, you win two out of three seasons, you get 50 wins. You deserve an extension. That's just, it just seems pretty simple to me. Yeah. Uh, and so like, I haven't been his biggest fan, but I totally understand. And even in a certain way, agree with this. It, this is the way the business works, work the business. Yep. hundred percent. And, uh, Really saying that uh, they're talking about Nico getting an extension now. Give Nico whatever extension he wants. Yeah. Do not lose the man. Give him. He, he might have had a rough maybe <laughs> first year in in the seat, you know, with the whole Brunson thing. I get it. That's fair. Yeah. But uh, everything he's done the last two years, incredible. Like I, just I blame Cuban years. for that. Yeah. I blame Cuban for Brunson. I really do. Yeah. I mean, even up to the trade deadline of that West Finals year run, twenty twenty two. Uh, they still had a chance even then. They just literally gave the same extension Brunson would have signed to Doreen, which at the time I was like, oh, I love that. He's yeah. very deserving. Um, and I think it was, but it's like, man, in hindsight, if you could have kept one, <laughs> but yeah. it is what it is, man. Uh, Nico found a way to, to turn uh, to turn chicken something else into chicken salad because <laughs> uh, sure. you get Kyrie 
on, you know, when his value is at its lowest and now look what he's turned into, you keep him and now you've built this team as you have just phenomenal stuff there um, with that. So before we go into wrapping this up here, yes, I'll make the bold proclamation that Maverick should keep Nico Harrison. I think that, uh, I think that would be wise. It's a hot take. I know. Yeah. Going out way on that ledge there. <laughs> the, the mob is forming. I feel, um, <laughs> Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see how these two teams match up. Uh, if you're if you're up for it, uh, absolutely would love to touch base again during the the series at some point. To Anytime, talk. man. Absolutely. Cool. cool. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Are there any other closing points we want to touch on? Anything like that? I guess plug, let them know where they can find you and all that. Well, just my final point would be, you know, keep an eye on the free throw shooting. Yeah. Keep an eye on the free throw shooting. The Thunder were a considerably better free throw shooting team. They were at the very, very top of the league. The Mavs were very, very, very average, below average. Um, And yet in the series against the Pelicans, the Thunder had a pretty rough free throw shooting series. And so Mm. keep an eye on that. Can we hit our free throws? Can we take the freebies? I think that might be uh, an important part in one of these games. That is, that's a, that's a great point because free throw shooting Dallas did okay in the first round, but you still had guys like Lively's not a, not done great with free throws. Um, Who's uh, another case here. Luca has done pretty well with free throws recently, but we we've seen in the past uh, in the playoffs where free throws have been a bit of an Achilles heel for him as well. Yeah. And um, PJ is, is weirdly not a very good free throw shooter. So PJ Gafford, lively Derek Jones, Jr. None of those yeah. guys are good. I pulled up my stat here. Oklahoma city was number three in the league at 82 and a half percent from three. The Mavs were 27th at under 76%. Yeah. That, yeah. that can decide a playoff game. Got to be careful there. For sure. Especially when your best free throw shooter, Kai hardly ever gets to the line. He, yeah, he never draws. He never, yeah. for as much as he goes into the paint, he draws a shockingly low amount of uh, foul calls. Does not, to get, does to the not line. get that whistle. Yeah. So that, that is something to watch for sure. That's a great point to close on. So yeah. Uh, let them know where they can, where they can find your stuff. Um, uh, would love to uh, set that up. Absolutely, man. Anytime. Always reach out. I'd be happy to, to hang out. Uh, you can find me on YouTube um, under The Mavs Pod, TMP, The Mavs Pod. You can find me on Twitter uh, at Mavs Highlights. Cool. All right. I uh, appreciate you coming on. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Don't forget to like the video, drop a comment below, subscribe. Also, check out TMP's content. Uh, and until next time, guys, remember every legend was once a prospect. Peace.